presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Hey, Robert, how you doing, man? Yes, good, and thank you for taking my call. I wanted to Morning. let you know that I've been a subscriber for a couple of years, just different members of your team, and I really enjoy it. But really the reason I'm calling is to express my sincerest gratitude for you providing that information yesterday on the small business grant. I'm a small business owner and primary breadwinner for my family and if I can get that money it's going to really mean a lot to my family so that's awesome. thank you for uh, taking the time to do that. No, well listen man we appreciate you growling a problem with us. Now, Tom O'Brien. <laughs> Welcome, folks. This is Jacob filling in for Tom O'Brien. He will be back tomorrow for your usual programming. Taking a look today, um, it seems like the big seven, the magnificent seven, they're kind of selling off just a little bit, right? We have Meta up moderately at 0.5. We have Tesla down point, uh, excuse me, uh, 2%. Apple down 1.25. NVIDIA off a little bit at 1%. Microsoft down 2 Let's take a look here. Meta is obviously introducing threads. That was one of the consequences, I feel like, of Elon Musk making some of the Twitter code open source. Um, it's time to compete. You know, I was, I was talking to Tom maybe a while, uh, I don't know, probably around when Elon purchased Twitter and took it private. You know, there's going to be so many kind of changes made to that platform, and there already have been, right? And the further it goes away from what it was originally, uh, the more that creates kind of an environment for someone to come in and fill in the niche that was uh, that original Twitter was filling in. And I had anticipated this maybe a year later, two years later, uh, but to see uh, Zuckerberg coming in so swiftly and, uh, you know, kind of offering threads was, was pretty interesting. Um, again, I think there is a massive niche for just a very simple kind of wall of reading text, essentially, people to go out there and just put their opinions out uh, with none of the added bells and whistles and kind of the complicated mess that um, Musk has made Twitter. And so we'll see if that, you know, w once that gets ironed out, and I had tried to check it out, I don't have an Instagram or anything, so I wasn't able to create a Threads account, um, but with family members who have it, I took a look, and it's still ways to go on it. Um, but this will be just another source of massive revenue uh, for Meta, and uh, more data for them to sell out to marketing firms. When I take a look at Goldman Sachs, um, you know, speaking about, we can look at Meta, obviously, they, Zuckerberg stopped that whole Metaverse move, right? And everyone loved it uh, because it was just a massive waste of money and it wasn't going anywhere. And I feel like what Goldman Sachs is about to do might do the same. Obviously, we're trading still at pretty high with Goldman Sachs at 317. Um, but a few months ago, I came out and was talking about um, how they're gonna back up the Apple credit card. And this was Goldman Sachs trying to get into the consumer banking market. For whatever reason, that's not uh, what they wanna do anymore. Their uh, current executives are kind of a little bit under fire for all these different investments that they're making and trying to breach into new uh, territory. And it's just not, um, paying off for them. And I think they're getting a lot of flack for it. Um, so they're trying to basically shift and offload Apple credit card. Um, at least in this article, they're saying American Express. Now, there have not been any serious talks whatsoever. Uh, this is not a uh, sure kind of thing that they are going to give it to, say, American Express, but it, they definitely are looking to offload it. If we can take a look here. The uh, talks uh, come amid a broader retreat by Goldman uh, from its largely failed consumer banking initiatives, uh, for which the CEO, David Solomon, has taken a great deal of heat. Uh, last week, CNBC reported the Wall Street giant is preparing to take a huge write-down on its 2021 acquisition of fintech lender Green Sky. The Wall Street Journal first reported the Goldman Sachs talks with American Express. The newspaper said there's no assurance of a deal, nor is the agreement close. Uh, it would mark an abrupt reversal for the two corporate giants. Uh, in October, the journal reported Goldman and Apple renewed their partnership through 2029. 
uh, and in April, Goldman Chief Financial Officer Coleman touted a deepening of the partnership. Now, there might be a deepening of a partnership and there might be, you know, some other way that they kind of operate with Apple. If Apple wants to extend some kind of credit line or, you know, do anything like that. But uh, we might see a, basically a sell off of um, kind of their stake in that. And also now as well, you know, looking more at that Apple card and I took some more time to look into it. They can change that rate at any time. It's a very appealing rate at 4.5 percent. Um, and there's a lot of other options that younger folks can get into that give them uh, higher returns. And we'll see kind of how that affects the rest of the banking industry. Um, we'll look at an article a little bit later that talks about how that's a bit of a headache for some of them. Uh, but anyways, just some interesting news and kind of this attempt of legacy companies uh, trying, to, trying to shift their position um, for, the, for the modern age. So it's quite interesting to see how that uh, goes out. You know, I love talking about cybersecurity on this talk. It's something I'm, I'm very interested in and uh, passionate about. We're taking a look at Honeywell, and they're going to purchase uh, an, an Israeli cybersecurity firm uh, called Scatafence. And this, this is a pretty interesting stock, too. Um, you know, we always like talking about the defense stocks on here as well. And, and Honeywell is interesting because not only is it defense, but you have a bunch of other things that kind of go with it as well. And that's trading about 207 uh, right now. Nothing that stands out exceptionally to me whatsoever. Um, it, you know, this is on the year to date. But since June, this is the last day with any kind of significant volume. And, you know, we tested that and uh, came back up on it. We can take a little bit of a look. And, and let, me, let me say quickly, to really reinforce why this is such an important thing and why I harp on it all the time, and I do, and, I, and I've said this before as well, but, you know, last, what was it, two weeks ago when I was filming for Tom, we were looking at uh, the DOE. They got ransomware okay? A few weeks earlier, we were talking about how major companies are de-investing from their cybersecurity um, sector, excuse me, their cybersecurity uh, departments. And then today, uh, we have this coming out, which is data from 11 million patients exposed in an HEA healthcare theft. Personal data of about 11 million patients of HCA Healthcare Incorporated were exposed uh, in an online forum. The largest U.S. hospital operator discovered a list with names, email addresses, phone numbers, birth dates, and information about their appointments. It didn't include clinical records, payment details, passwords, or social security numbers. And, you know, that happens very often in data breaches, which uh, companies are not required to expose, by the way. Data breaches at healthcare companies are often considered among the most serious as they may contain a person's most private information um, and then obviously intimate information as well when you're talking about social security numbers, payment details, and, and possible family ties and, and health history. Healthcare companies face growing cybersecurity risks with the accumulation of sensitive personal data and threats of ransomware that seize critical networks and upend systems crucial uh, to care delivery. And guys, this is done by other governments as well, right? This isn't just gangs online, even though that does happen sometimes. I mean, this is a serious national, national security threat. We'll talk a little bit about um, Honeywell acquiring Scatafence when we get back. Stay tuned. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. 
A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Okay, so before we went to the break, we were talking about Honeywell acquiring um, the Israeli company uh, Scatafence. It's a cybersecurity company. Uh, this is what Honeywell is saying about the cybersecurity industry in general. Uh, that is expected to grow more than $10 billion over the next several years. And it has plans to integrate Scatafence into the Forge cybersecurity suite, which is massive. Um, providing expanded asset discovery, threat detection, and compliance management capabilities. And... The more that governments around the world get serious about this, this compliant management capabilities will be massive. Um, it notes in this article, um, this is from the Wall Street Journal's uh, Pro Cybersecurity, which I recommend checking out. Um, let's see here, at least this is from, the, this is from cybersecurity, cybersecurity company Dragos. It said the amount of hackers that target the control systems um, of operational technology increased by 35%, but it also notes that chief information officers uh, use mainly multiple suites um, from one company, right? And there are so many reasons for that. Um, you know, obviously, if you're using a bunch of tools that may be out of the general training or understanding, if, you know, if you're outsourcing cybersecurity, essentially, um, or you only have a small team, um, it's far easier to resolve issues that exist in the software that you're using when it's just one company you're buying everything from. And this is what you're seeing cybersecurity companies do. Um, this is what Honeywell is doing, right? They, they need more things in what they're offering, so you're just basically purchasing other companies and implementing it and uh, you know training your guys to teach that. It, it's extremely important, and it'll only become more important, important as time goes on. Um, Investors and executives alike say that many chief information security officers now prefer to buy multiple services, obviously, rather than single products from many. Security chiefs are also challenging their vendors to demonstrate the value of their products more than before. And that's just because it is so high stakes. Everything is going digital. It is not going to roll back. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. And I think that Honeywell uh, might be positioned um, decently for that. Obviously, you want to look at Cisco as well. And, you know, I'll take a look at some more public companies that deal in that. A lot of them are very small private firms. Um, but, you know, they make it's such a lucrative business to get into if, if you know what you're doing and you're qualified enough. We want to stay in kind of the tech talk. We have a few things we can talk about. Uh, the first one I want to go into is, again, speaking about this generative AI, uh, what we've been seeing recently with the language models, and kind of the talk that goes around with any new technology, right? And I mentioned this before on it. In the, in the past, you know, with the Industrial Revolution, I mean, you did have 
jobs going away, right, and people entering uh, new industries. But again, these barriers to entry into the new industries were not so high. You know, if you were once a farmer or, you know, whatever, sheathing wheat, now you went on to the factory line. And of course, there is a there is a learning curve. Um, but, you know, that can be addressed within about, you know, whatever. Let's just say six months or something like that. With AI and generative AI and how good it's getting and how rapid it's in, how rapidly it's improving, um, I've had the kind of general feeling that it's not going to be the same way, right? Of course, new jobs will develop out of this. But the question is, is can that keep up with the pace of jobs being lost to AI? Um, and if not, what are we going to do as a society to try to dampen that uh, kind of impact, right? We saw what happens with losing jobs, you know, to American industry, where a ton of people obviously lost their jobs overnight when everything got offshored. And um, that had lasting impacts uh, for our nation that we still deal with today and the manifestations of that we still deal with today. This was a poll um, of the CNBC CFO Council and the CNBC Technology Executive Council. And it showed that C-suite executives have differing views on the labor impact of AI in meaning from the general concept, right? Which is new jobs will be created and this will be okay. And the top CFOs are more likely uh, to see it as a job destro uh, destroyer um, than one that creates new jobs. Workers are worried, and this is from the article, workers are worried, but notably the fears are nowhere near the majority view. Of about one quarter, 24% have concerns that AI will make their job ins, uh, obsolete. Um, obviously, with marginalized workers uh, fearing the most. Inside the C-suite at major corporations where decisions will be made about AI implementation and return on investment, uh, there is a notable split, but one rises to the top, and that is top finance executives are more likely um, to see this as a job destroyer. Almost half, 41%. Uh, say that AI will destroy more jobs than it creates. Uh, an equal percentage say it's too soon to tell. Uh, but given the choice of potential futures, uh, just 18% say that they see AI as a job creator. And of course, you know, that's not a complete death knell, and they, and they might be incorrect at that. But, you know, these are guys at the top, and they um, are at the top. You know, we'd like to think for their ability to kind of forecast and make uh, decisions based on that. I do think that it'll become, you know, more of a discussion as time goes on uh, when we will see in the beginning that jobs are just lost entirely and nothing new is added for quite a while. Uh, this discussion is obviously going to grow greater. And that honestly may serve to deepen the schism that exists in our country today, which would be a shame because there is a potential for technological advancements like this to really unite us and kind of move forward out of... Um, you know, whatever we're in uh, prior. Let's take a look at well as well um, in the tech sector, some issues with chips that we're gonna see. First, you know, we have some problems with NVIDIA. Um, obviously the stock is doing quite well right now. Um, obviously down from its top at 439, but I don't know if we really expected it to settle above that rate. That was definitely uh, an impressive run. Um, but the semiconductor industry has been on the decline anyways over the, for almost a year. NVIDIA, one of the top ones, has seen decreases in the price of their RTX 460, with the car dropping by as much um, as 6% within just weeks of its launch. That had a tepid reception from reviewers, and it's not a fantastic start, this article is saying. This has resulted in customers gravitating towards older graphics cards from both AMD and NVIDIA themselves. And we might see an issue in the future. You know, obviously this kind of decrease in demand for the top will um, decrease prices. Uh, but the problem is, is a lot of the rare earth materials, notably uh, gallium and germanium, um, might have a supply issue in the future as China is a major producer of it. We in America do have it, I think in Alaska and Tennessee. Um, but not nearly as much as China. Uh, I know at least for germanium, China produces something like 60% or upwards of 60% of it. But as a way to kind of bite back against the Huawei ban and some other things going on regarding chips and uh, their sale in China, 
China is seeking to restrict the supply of gallium and germanium. Uh, These are two materials used in computer chips and other products. Now, we have a lot of it in America, but I think one of the major issues that we have is it's not, um, at least for gallium, it's not profitable to mine gallium by itself. It's still very cheap um, based on a gram or an ounce of it. And so you want to mine it with other things as well. This is notably like zinc. And, you know, you can get a profit on that side. Folks, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be right back. We'll just talk a little bit briefly about this and kind of what impact it might have. We can theorize on that. Folks, stay tuned. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFN. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right, welcome back, folks. We were talking a little bit about the chip sector and the impact that the uh, kind of restriction that China is imposing on gallium and germanium exports will have. You know, in, in some sense, y this might come to bite them a little bit. They don't have the capabilities to really process these minerals beyond a certain point. Uh, so a lot of it gets shipped out to other uh, Asian countries, such as Japan, and from there it's processed even further and, and shipped out. There are some issues um, in the short term on it. The, the main thing to take away from this um, is it's meant to hit m more than likely the defense sector in the US, right? So you can still apply um, for kind of licensing to get this kind of stuff, um, but obviously China has far more control over it. 
I was right on the germanium being 60% 60, 60 of the world's um, production of germanium there, and they have 90% of the world's gallium, uh, which is pretty intense. So this new export license regime will start uh, beginning uh, August 1st, and right after it was announced, purchase orders reportedly began swarming into Chinese gallium and germanium producers. The stockpiling has raised the price of these two materials. Uh, AXT, an American maker of semiconductor wafers, quickly responded to say uh, that his China-based subsidiary would apply for an export license to maintain business as usual. Now, this is a key thing to note in this. It says it's important to remember that this is not a ban, but a licensing system. Uh, which means the impact will depend on how difficult it is to secure an export license. Obviously, that is, you know, that, <laughs> there's, there's a lot to that, right? The, the party is still controlling who gets what and where it goes. Um, and that, you know, will effectively be used to, to choke off some things here. Uh, the ability to control who can be granted the permits will give China, obviously, more leverage in trade negotiations. Furthermore, in more chip news, uh, Foxconn dumped the 19.5 billion Vendanta uh, chip plan in a blow to India. This is pretty intense. Taiwan's Foxconn has withdrawn from a 19.5 billion uh, semiconductor joint venture with Indian metals to oil conglomerate Vedanta. Uh, it said on Monday, the world's largest contract electronics maker signed a pact with Vedanta last year to set up semiconductor and display production plants uh, in Modi's, which is the uh, PM of India, home state of uh, Gujarat. Foxconn has determined it will not move forward on the joint venture with Vendanta, a Foxconn statement said without elaborating on reasons. You know, and I wonder too, I, I was reading a little bit last night um, how key the country of Malaysia is in a lot of um, production offshores. Uh, apparently they have a pretty sizable textile industry and um, they're big in pharmaceuticals as well. And, and so as, as more people try to get out of China, um, obviously this is a little bit different since it's, you know, Taiwan seeking to kind of expand out. But let's just look at, you know, the general kind of business that goes on in Asia. And a lot of stuff is outsourced or they're doing manufacturing uh, because it's cheaper, you know, so on. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if countries like Malaysia or some of these smaller ones that, you know, don't have a very hostile um you know, relationship with the West and, and aren't extremely cozied up to China, we'll, we'll see if they can go to the top. And that's just kind of me musing on it, but it was super, I, I just didn't realize how I integral Malaysia was, especially to the pharmaceutical industry uh, in America. But, um, you know, I even, most of my clothes now that I wear, uh, you know, I remember far back in the day when I was younger, um, a lot of stuff would be made in, made in China, but now I see a lot of stuff made in Vietnam. Um, so it's interesting to see how that'll pivot. And obviously India, has such a sizable population uh, that would benefit um, from more production and manufacturing, kind of the same style that the Chinese did in the 80s. Uh, Vedanta said it is fully committed to its semiconductor project and have, quote, lined up other partners to set up India's first foundry. Uh, Vedanta has redoubled its efforts to fulfill Modi's vision. Uh, a source familiar with the matter said concerns about incentive approval delays by India's government had contributed to Foxconn's decision to pull out of the venture. That's sad. Honestly, uh, New Delhi had also raised several questions on the cost estimates provided uh, to request incentives from the government, the source added. And uh, Modi, again, the PM of India, has made chip making a top priority for India's economic strategy uh, in pursuit of a new era in electronics manufacturing. And Foxconn's move uh, represents a blow to his ambitions. And, you know, here's the thing. If again, there's so many people there, if you can get the materials and that's, you know, the refining of kind of the necessary rare earth materials, um, is not a limiting factor. Uh, moving this kind of stuff to India, uh, that would greatly decrease the price of chips everywhere, and we could see some pretty interesting um, moves forward uh, in consumer products. So, anyways, that kind of sums up, at least for me, kind of some chip news, some very interesting stuff going on with it. Staying on kind of the metals talk, I saw GDX today. That's up 2.17%. Um, the gold contract is down minor. I mean, it's pretty flat today at 1931. Uh, but the GDX is up 2.17% today, and all of its weighting is, uh, all the components of that ETF are going up higher as well. I'm just going to look at Newmont. Oh, there we are. So we're up today on that. 
Um, let's see, what else do we have on that? Barrett Gold, obviously, we have up 1.19% today. So it's a good day for the GDX. And I was reading this article from the Financial Times, and it's uh, the central banks move gold back home after the freeze on Russian assets. There is a, uh, there is a video on YouTube that goes into the, um, the resource kind of mining that they do in Russia, and it is insane. Uh, the one in particular I was watching was about diamonds, and they have one of the largest diamond pits in the world, I think the largest. Um, but the same goes, uh, you know, for for gold and other kind of minerals they do. And it is just such a uh, mammoth undertaking, um, and, and it's done in such a unique way. And I'd recommend, you know, kind of exploring that a little bit later if you're just into kind of, I guess, the, the, the provenance of uh, raw materials um, and how other countries do it. Uh, but central banks globally have made record uh, purchases of gold in 2022 into the first quarter of this year as they hunted for safe havens uh, from high inflation and volatile bond prices. According to a survey of sovereign investors and in China and Turkey together accounted for one fifth of the purchases. Obviously, Turkey trying to turn around their uh, horrible economy, at least, you know, they're <laughs> regarding their money. Um, concerned by the decision uh, by the U.S. and others to freeze Russian assets, central banks opted to buy physical gold rather than derivatives or exchange-traded funds that track the metal's price. Uh, they also preferred to hold it in their own country as global tensions increased. Invesco's survey found that 68% of central banks held part of their gold reserves domestically, up from 50% in 2020. In five years, that figure is expected to rise to uh, 74%, the survey showed. So gold you know, it's still king for this baby. You always come back to it. It's not crypto, it's not anything else. It's always gold at the end of the day on this. And uh, in some ways you gotta love it. You gotta love the tradition on that. Now, up until this year, central banks were willing to buy or sell gold through ETFs and gold swaps, said Invesco's head of official institutions, Rod Ringro. Uh, this year has been much more physical gold and the desire to hold gold in country rather than overseas with other central banks. It's part of the reaction to the freezing, obviously, of the Bank of Russia's reserves. So, yeah, we could talk about that, too, the, <laughs> how, how financial institutions buy derivatives uh, instead of the actual thing and how that continually messes them up. That was notice, uh, notably an issue uh, with the Guild crisis in the UK where they were buying um, derivatives, or they're holding derivatives on their uh, equivalent of bonds, and that just went really upside down for them. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today.
An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors, such as traders and active investors. Distributor for Side Fund Services, LLC. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no cash or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. Welcome back, folks. Uh, over the break, I was looking at this article from Reuters. Um, <clears throat> it's about the challenges that LNG uh, export projects uh, face in the future. And this is talking particularly about uh, the construction um, job issue that they're having. It starts off with the coming wave of North American liquefied natural gas export projects face staffing challenges that are prompting some of the biggest developers to expand training and coordinate projects to keep construction workers. Now, I actually this weekend had a <clears throat> really interesting conversation with an old buddy of mine. I hadn't seen him in a while. And uh, for you know quite a while now, he's been working at a very large welding company. And this company uh, welds basically chambers that liquefy gas. And, you know, I think they do ones for methane in particular, um, but this goes, you know, this goes for the whole industry in general. And I was talking to him about how his job was going. And what he was saying is they are facing, again, a massive staffing issue in that they need at least four times the amount of people that they have working currently. And this is a very, very large um, welding firm and uh, they get you know tons of contracts even globally right um, he said in order to kind of they're backlogged by years right and in order to get some of these projects underway they're just kind of hiring people who are certified to weld and it doesn't necessarily mean if you're certified that you're good <clears throat> at what you're doing and he was telling me uh, you know they have a, a line basically for all the different components of the of the um, you know chamber uh, for welding, and he's saying a lot of the lines on there are not doing a good enough job, and that they completely fail uh, testing. And this sets things. I mean, these will be you know something like 13 week projects, all the way up to like an entire year, depending on the project itself. Um, and all that can just go away right at testing, which is what's which is what's done at the end, right? Because you have to test the entire system. Um, you kind of have to have a, a waterfall method for that, a uh, waterfall, you know, kind of testing method for that. And he said it, it's terrible. Um, they're paying a lot of money for it, but what happens is you, they are paying less money for these kind of people who have no experience whatsoever, and this just ends up causing more and more issues. He's telling me these crazy stories of uh, key welds that are supposed to be under immense amount of pressure, um, and they're just not tested. Um, and if they are tested, uh, they fail. And how they have it there is certain workers will test their own welds. And a lot of these workers don't have integrity um, in order to be like, this weld doesn't work. And, and they'll do something to pass it off as legitimate. And we're talking about like very, very, uh, you, you know, these are very complex structures. <clears throat> they go under immense amounts of pressure, uh, immense pre uh, temperature changes, and, and they need to be welded precisely. And uh, it, you know, for him, as someone who has, you know, integrity and um, is educated and does a good job, I'd imagine that's that's pretty, uh, you know, heartbreaking in a lot of ways. But it's it's also not a great look for like our country going forward if our new young generation, um, you know, can't step up to the plate and and know how to do this stuff. 
And so in the next few years, we might see continual issues with this and the product that's put out, um, you know, won't be up, you know, to par, essentially. It's a very strange issue and one that you kind of see throughout history, too, where just, you know, the, the, the generations going forward, just for whatever reason, um, lack interest in, in doing things that keep the society going. And it kind of just peters out. And of course, I might be dramatizing, you know, the outcome of that. But what my friend was saying was real. And he said it's a ma major issue, <clears throat> at least according to this, uh, this article. I said, labor has grown as inflationary concern for everyone in the industry. Uh, we need to actively forecast and manage labor availability and supply chain like never before. In the past, soaring construction costs in U.S. LNG projects hurt project economics and even led to bankruptcy for one major contractor. Uh, and that was said by, by key leaders in this industry. So we have multiple projects that are underway at the same time in four mega projects with the possibility of a fifth to be announced soon and they require the same type of labor and this will only drive up labor costs increase schedule risks and create productivity issues and this is exactly um, what my guy is saying as well and really it, it may result in again hiring just people who aren't up to the task and so you lower your standard you know as a company and therefore as a culture we lower our standard and that creates so many issues um Bachel, is developing projects uh, with some 27 uh, MTPA type tank of new capacity, including Sempra's Port Arthur LNG project and expansion into Chenier's Energy Corpus Christi plant. At present, um, Bechel has more than 3,000 professionals working on its LNG projects. At peak, the company expects the number to grow close to 20,000 uh, craft professionals. And I wonder, you know, maybe the onus, again, is on us as other like American citizens to be like, we need to push this more um, for the youth and bringing stuff back like that. I mean, this is no longer like a bad <laughs> uh, industry to get into. Uh, you know, the, the experienced welders that I know do very well for themselves. I mean, very well for themselves, more so than a lot of your college guys coming out and, you know, working for their first five years. So anyways, I just thought that was kind of interesting and it was a decent segue or not segue, but a kind of vehicle, you know, to discuss some of the issues that we might see as a society going forward if we don't get kind of serious. The younger generation doesn't get kind of serious about what we're doing and kind of our stake that we have in the society and how it's going to kind of going to be up to us in the future when the, uh, you know, current generations are kind of gone or, or retired. So anyways. Move over to here. Um, Fed's uh, bar was talking about some new regulations that might need to be uh, for banks, essentially, right? Present for banks. Uh, this says here the Fed's bar says nation's biggest banks, they need more capital. Uh, the officials are expected to propose bigger financial cushions this summer. Federal Reserve's regulatory chief said that he has decided to beef up the financial cushions for larger banks. Uh, moves, he said, would help boost the resilience of the system after a spate of mid-size bank failures this year. Events over the past few years, excuse me, a few months, have only reinforced the need for humility and skepticism and for an approach that makes banks resilient to both familiar and unanticipated risks. The changes which regulators are expected to propose this summer uh, come after what Barr described as a, quote, holistic review of big bank capital requirements. Under the plan, the largest banks could be required to hold an additional two percentage points of capital or an additional $2 of capital for every $100 of risk-weighted assets. Uh, obviously, capital is the buffer banks are required to hold to absorb potential losses. Uh, the precise amount of additional capital will depend on a firm's business activities, uh, with the biggest increase is expected to be reserved for the largest, most complex U.S. mega banks. The plan to ratchet up capital is expected to be the first of several steps to beef up rules for Wall Street. Uh, it has already sparked pushback from the industry and its allies on Capitol Hill, who generally say the existing framework is robust and allowed banks to emerge from the pandemic triggered downturn in strong shape. Yeah, and that's interesting, right? Because the issues that went on in the mid-sized banks, uh, I, I mean, you know, I suppose that more cash might have helped them in, in some capacity. I think it did with um, SVB. But that wasn't really the issue. That was a scheduling problem, and, and the larger banks didn't have an issue with that. But I will say also, you know, 
um, can never be too safe, um, especially with a rapidly changing environment and a, a new world with new risks uh, that we all have to uh, be prepared for. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. Uh, at the end of every show, I like reading a little, uh, you know, science article or some kind of news for the day. Uh, this one here is pretty interesting. Not a lot of people know, but a lot of pharmaceuticals uh, use precursors that are derived from, uh, you know, petroleum or crude oil products. Uh, so these scientists actually have made now painkillers uh, from pine trees instead of these products, uh, the crude oil products. <clears throat> so these uh, common painkillers were uh, paracetamol and ibuprofen. Obviously, we all are familiar with these. Um, instead of using uh, precursors from crude oil, they uh, got it from uh, beta pinene, which is a component of turpentine, uh, which is a waste byproduct from the paper industry. And folks, if there is one grand lesson you can learn, um, you know, I mean, we were speaking the other day about how people are using viruses now to hunt bacteria as um, antibiotics are not becoming uh, viable anymore. Uh, Mother Nature always has an answer. There's always a solution and we can work with her instead of against her. And it's always going to be a, a beautiful thing if we can uh, harmonize uh, human desire and the health of the environment together. Uh, so they successfully converted beta pinene into two everyday painkillers. We already spoke about them. Uh, synthesized a range of other precursor chemicals from turpentine 
including uh, 4-HAP, which is the precursor of drugs, including beta blockers, which are very widely used now, and uh, asthma inhaler drug salbutamol, as well as others widely used for perfumes and cleaning products. Uh, so they hope this more sustainable, quote, biorefinery approach could replace the need for crude oil products in the chemical industry. Dr. Josh Tibbetts, research associate with the University Department of Chemistry, said using oil to make pharmaceuticals is unsustainable. Not only is it contributing to rising CO2 emissions, uh, but the price fluctuates dramatically as we are greatly dependent on the geopolitical stability of countries with large oil reserves. And it is only going to get more expensive. Instead of extracting more oil from the ground, we want to replace this in the future with a biorefinery model. A turpentine-based biorefinery model uses waste chemical byproducts from the paper industry. Folks, it's already trash. Let's use it instead. We can get off of oil dependency, and it might be kind of cool. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. Tom will be back tomorrow, and he'll be with us for the rest of the week and onward. Have a great rest of your day.